It's the revolution will be individualized. It's TK Coleman and I got my brother Kamau. What's happening, KO? What's up, man? Let's get this thing. Let's get this thing, man. Life and legacy of Tupac part two. Let's make it do what it do. Yeah, I'm 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 looking forward to this uh simply because I think, you know, when people think of revolutionaries, they think of somebody who you know, led an army of people to take down, uh, you know, some some government regime. But I think the way that we approach being a revolutionary, the way that we approach being a leader uh, has a lot more to do with creativity and a lot more to do with, uh, you know, it being innovative and, and, and tapping into, you know, your inner calling and then and speaking truth to that, you know, speaking power to that and allowing that to channel a message, a revolutionary message to, you know, the masses, to other people. And I think, you know, Tupac is somebody who who really stood in that, stood in his call and stood in the thing that made him so unique, stood in his values. And, you know, more than anything, he was a truth speaker. You know, he, he to, to whatever version that was true at that time in his life, he was going to stand by it and he was going to, speak his mind uh, to the media, to, you know, to the hip hop industry, to music fans, or to just a person walking on the street. And so, you know, what, what I'm looking forward in this episode is, is just to kind of break down, you know, how did he even get to that mindset, you know, and, and how did that play into his life and into his legacy? Right on, man. Trying to change other people is hard to accomplish, but it's an easy place to hide. A real revolutionary is someone that chooses to be radical, and there's nothing more radical than making the decision to just own who you are, to say what you really think, and do what you really want. Does that mean you'll be right all the time? No, because you're human. You're guaranteed to be wrong some of the time, but at least you have the guts to take a chance on being right about something, and at least you have the guts to own what it is you do. That's what this brother did. So let's talk about what we can learn from him. Let's do it. All I'm trying to do is survive and make good out of the dirty, nasty, unbelievable lifestyle that they gave me. Mm. You know, I, I wanted to jump in here and, and because what, what's interesting about his life is that he I think uh, in his work, he really he speaks from the perspective of the oppressed. Right. A lot. A, a lot of his work is is, you know, is kind of speaking to what it's like to be oppressed, what it's like to be at the bottom, what it's like to struggle, what it's like to have, you know, oppressive forces out for you. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that he resonated, you know, with with people from the bottom. I mean, I just people in general, right? People can relate to struggle, but I think that's why he rep, he, um, you know, he, he resonated so hard in his music, just, uh, really just spoke to people on on a deep level but what's just interesting and I, and I was curious to hear you kind of talk about was this this difference between you know looking at they as uh you know the the reason for your suffering versus um versus you know I guess like empowering yourself and, and, and figuring out how you get to take responsibility. Because I think even though he spoke to messages about being oppressed, he also wasn't a victim in a lot of ways. Like he didn't, he, he, he it was just really interesting the way that his music came out because he spoke about the, the victim mindset, but he, he didn't necessarily succumb to that. He didn't give up to that. He just kind of had the approach that like, yeah, my situation sucks, but I'm going to play the hell out of the hand that I was dealt. And and that's kind of what his life is is the biggest example of. And so I think it's just really interesting, this dichotomy of this victim mindset versus this victory mindset and how he kind of bounces back and forth and how he, you know, speaks to, uh, you know, that experience of, of being oppressed, but also... Um, mm -hmm. You know, also kind of there, there's messages of empowerment in there, too. And so that's not something that you hear a lot. I think some people get stuck on one side of the spectrum or they get stuck on the other side of the spectrum. And the other side being that 
you know, you're not oppressed. There's nothing going on here. You know, you're, you're just in your head. You're delusional. Um, but somebody like Tupac, you know, did did experience that right did did see his family members his parents who were both members of the black panther party and who did face um you know just like wrongdoing by uh the state wrongdoing by forces uh that that you know may have unjustly uh handled their situation and so i i think he can speak to what it's like uh, and that feeling, and and because he was so closely uh, in, intertwined with just the system, and 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 seeing his parents go through it, seeing him go through it, um, but he also was somebody who who led a life that was all about like taking control and and mm. making the best. Yeah, I once heard it said that pain is when you experience harm or hardship. Suffering is when you allow who you are to be defined exclusively by pain. Pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. And I think what he was talking about there was the fact that you can be real about your pain while also remaining hopeful about your potential for progress. That you can be real about the things that happen to you while still approaching with an empowered mindset the possibilities that you get to define for your own life. And I love how he said, I'm taking the life that they gave me and I'm making something beautiful and artistic with it because there is always a they. But the question in life is, what are you going to do about what they do? Because there are some people who will say, oh, don't go around acting like people are out to get you. And I'm here to say, yeah, you should go around acting like people are to get you because some people are out to get you for a lot of different reasons. Wake up. Everybody in this world doesn't love you. Everybody has a day. The day might change from person to person, but you can be sure there is a they out there who wants to see you fail. There is a mm. they out there who will laugh at you if you embarrass yourself. There is a they out there that's talking about you behind your back right now. Every single one of us who moves through this life will have a they who wants to see us fail and fall. And you've got to take what they throw at you and decide for yourself that you're not going to allow what they do to define you. That's the difference between the victim mindset and the victory mindset. We all have problems. We all have hardships. We all have things that we cannot control. But are we going to make art with it? Or are we simply going to attach ourselves to that story of pain and create suffering that we can't escape from? It was the philosopher Albert Camus who said, in the depth of winter, I found that there lay within me an invincible summer. None of us can control the fact that we have to go through winters in life, but we do get to cultivate that invincible summer. We do get to use those moments of winter to summon a part of ourselves that nothing in this world can defeat. And that's what this brother did with his art. He represented the undefeatable aspect of the human spirit. The part of us that says, nah, 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 nah. My circumstances and conditions don't define me. I do. Watch what I do with this. Watch what I do with what you throw at me. Mm. And and I think that mindset is really, it it, it is almost rebellious, right? It's it is almost revolutionary because you're choosing to go against what has been given to you. You're choosing to go against your circumstances. You're saying to hell with that. Like, I'm not I'm not I'm not taking what you guys give me. Um, And I think that that just takes a certain level of grit, a certain level, uh, a certain level of just rebelliousness and, and rambunctiousness where you're. You know, you you have almost this chip on your shoulder and and in the quote, he acknowledges like it's nasty, it's dirty, it's disrespectful. But I think that tone itself, that tone itself indicates that chip on his shoulder that like, how dare y'all like come to me and, 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 and give me this hand. But watch, watch what I do with it. You know, watch the life that I make of it. And I think that that's that's what makes Tupac so you know, attractive as, as just a figure, because I mean, to just get yeah. dealt 
nothing, right? To get dealt this crappy hand and to have this resting confidence, this attitude that like, like y'all, y'all don't even know what y'all just did. Like y'all messed up because you just fired up the beast in me. Like you, you just um, ignited something in me. And I think that really, it's all about framing. It's all about, you know, how you perceive things. It, it, it's a choice that you make. And I think a lot of times people who face oppositions or who face they's, you know, the, the they out there that's trying to, 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 you know, harm them or the they out there who doesn't want to see them win. I think people who face that, it, it's easy to just feel overwhelmed and it's easy to, to be like, my, like, what am I going to do? Like my, my circumstances suggest I've never had a chance to begin with. Um, yeah. And, and I think the mindset that, you know, that's really important and really near and dear to us, this brand, this message, our mission is to say the hell with that, like to hell with the odds that you thought that this was going to have on me. Uh, that the impact that, or the, the way that you thought these odds were going to take me down. Um, and it, it's just about cultivating that rebelliousness. Yeah, man, there's this story that I heard once about a concert pianist uh, who w was uh, getting ready to do a concert and the piano sitting out on stage and everybody's in the concert hall and this little boy is sitting next to his mother and he gets up and he runs on the stage and everyone in the audience is laughing and the mother is gasping with horror and the little boy runs towards the piano and, and the mother begins to chase after her son. And just at that point, the, the concert pianist comes out on the stage. He sees the little boy. He sees the mother coming after him and he motions for the mother to hold her peace. Let the boy do his thing. The pianist sits down at the keys. The little boy sits down and he just starts banging the piano and the pianist just takes his arms around him and begins to put chords to the discordant notes that the little boy was playing and the whole audience was just completely in awe. And one of the beautiful things that that analogy illustrates is that there is a form of brilliance that can only be recognized when you are up against something. There, there is a form of creativity that you can only display when somebody throws something at you that you were not prepared for. If that guy had just walked out and played the piano and wrote a beautiful song, people would have respected him but they respect him at a completely different level when they see something go wrong and they watch him handle it with class and style and poise and confidence. That's the kind of thing that makes you walk away and say, that guy is my goat. You know what I mean? You think about in, in a sport like basketball, for instance, the reason we love the players that we love isn't because they hit shots in an empty gym. If you remove the competition from the game, most of these guys are equal. How do you separate Jerry Stackhouse from Kobe Bryant? They both probably can hit jump shots all day in an empty gym. If we just had a layup contest with no one trying to block your shot, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between most professional basketball players. But it's what does that guy do when he's under pressure, when he's under the kind of pressure where if he misses that shot, his career is over. He's got two people guarding him at the same time. And this is the shot that determines everything. How does he show up then? And so you have to have layers of complexity and difficulty in your life that you overcome in order for that greatness that is within you to truly demonstrate itself. And so when you have these kinds of challenges where the world throws things at you, I'm not saying it's easy. It is incredibly hard and it's very easy to get resentful about it. I'm the first one to be able to tell you that. But those moments are really the moments that make your story worth telling. Because when people talk about your life when you're gone, trust me, they're not going to talk about all the boring stuff like, oh, yeah, they showed up and they did this and they did that and they did that. And that was cool. They're going to talk about that time where you demonstrated character or competence in a surprising way because you were going up against some form of adversity that would have made everybody understand if you buck, if you like bow down to it and failed. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 I think talking about it from the, the, the bigger perspective, right? Where it, I think in, in basketball, it, it, it feels a little bit easier to grapple and easier to, to mentally understand, like there is a person in front of me 
um, and I just got to do a certain move or there's two people in front of me and, and I know the things that are in, in my way blocking me. And, and I think it, it feels a little bit harder when it feels like a system or like this mysterious they is out to get you. It, it's exhausting, right? It, it feels like, when is this going to let up? You know, when, when, it, when yeah. am I going to just have uh, an opportunity uh, to, to just be free, right? To, to just kind of uh, have support or just, you know, to, to get a fair chance at this. And I, you know, I really don't think that there is, there's an easy solution to this. There's, it, there's no, there's nothing that we could tell you that's just like, oh, you know, in five years after you do this consistent thing, like smooth selling from there on out. I don't think yeah. it works like that. And I don't think you should even condition yourself to believe that that is, you know, an option or, or that's uh, the, the, the goal or the future you're trying to aim for. I think, yeah. you know, there's certain power in, in building yourself up to be prepared um, and to be and to be able to weather the storms, because I, I think in any kind of game, in any kind of, um, you know, situation where, th where there's all these different variables. And I think life is the biggest example of that. There's millions of variables that you don't necessarily have control over, that you don't know what's going to come. And I think you have to prepare for that. You have to prepare for all of the obstacles out there that, that you can't control, that you don't have right answers to. And so many times people discount the power that they do have. Uh, mm. And that's the message, right? It's, it's the power that you do have is actually more powerful than you think it is. And that there are things that you can do. Uh, there are ways that you can train your mind. Um, there, there's things, there's callings of yours that can empower you, that can help you uh, navigate the storms, right? Navigate all of the oppression that's being thrown at you. Like there, there's things that we're naturally given um, by the creator that that we can lean into. And, and we don't see it. I think a lot of times we're not trained to see that stuff as a source of salvation or as a source of freedom or as an avenue to help combat oppression. But, but I think, you know, that God-given ability, that thing that really makes you different, that makes you unique, that 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 that's that's your source of power. You know that that's yeah. that's the re yeah. that's that's going to be the way that you're 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 going to uh, elevate and you're going to um, do things that are miraculous. I think, you know, what if if you think about like a hero's journey or, or you trying to fight like a dragon. Obviously, the dragon is is going to outmatch you. It, it is more it's stronger. It's more powerful. It can breathe fire. And I think to just think of yourself as a mortal human being. Yeah, you, you probably are going to lose. But to, but if you think about yourself as somebody who has superpowers, who has secret weapons, who has things like you do have it, you do have little things that other people can't do that are superpowers uh, that you can use against the dragon. But I think it's an awareness first to know that, wow, these are actually tools in my tool belt that not everybody has, that these are kind of special and they're unique to me. And if you start to think about those things as superpowers and start to cultivate them, you can then leverage them to, to fight these dragons, right? To, to deal with the, the storms and, and to weather the journey and, 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 and to come out on top, right? Um, yeah. So it, it, it's just, it's about framing, right? It's about choosing what to place your faith in, choosing what uh, what are the things that actually give you the power. And to me, I mean, that's what freedom looks like, right? It, it's, it's, it's leaning in to your superpower uh, and, and viewing that as a vehicle to your salvation. Yeah, that's so good, man. That's so good. And, and, and your superpower doesn't even have to be something that you compare with other people's superpower, right? It's it's about being better than your past self. It's about recognizing that you are always in process, that your story is not finished, that if you're alive and well enough to talk about your story, even though you may talk about it bitterly, that that's proof in and of itself that you have the power to write the next chapter. You're in process. You have a future. 
and you get to have an additional say. I was just talking with um, Dr. Thunder about this, and he was talking about um, lessons that he learned in jazz. One of the interesting things he said is, it's never about the note you're currently playing. It's about mm. the next note. It's the next note. That's the one that determines everything because that next note might canonize you or that next note might condemn you. The current note you're on, it might make everybody's ears ring. It might sound like it's really bad and off key, but that next note can make you look like a genius for playing that off note, right? What's that next note? And so your life may currently seem like it's on a discordant note. It may seem like it's currently off key, but you get to decide what that next note is. And that next note could be the note that changes anything or changes everything. And though, and those notes, those next notes are the choices that you make in your life that are about what am I going to do with what they gave me? Let's go to the second quote. Until it happened, I really did believe that no black person would ever shoot me. I believed that I didn't have to fear my own community. You know, I was like, I represent them. I'm their ambassador to the world. They will never do me wrong. I'm curious why you picked this one, man. This is an interesting quote. Yeah. This is a very this yeah. this is a good one for me because I think it just illustrates something that a lot of uh, black leaders have to wrestle with, right? Um, especially if they came from the hood, which you know, for hip hop and and for people in 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 that um, you know in in that industry in that arena in that in that creative space, you know, experience the fullest, right? And I, I've heard people who who. Who, who tried to, uh, you know, illustrate this, like, I, I, I'm i down with my people, but at the same time, like, I don't, I don't, I don't trust certain groups, right? Like, I, I think you see this a lot in gang culture where, you know, um, like, I'm, 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 I'm pro black, but at the same time, like, I could easily see, I could get murked by like some, some rival gang. And I mean, it, to me, it's, it's, I think this quote really, it, it's just such an interesting dynamic of, of standing for something, standing for, for a people, but also, you know, being, being scared or being fearful in a way uh, of, of, you know, a certain outcome um, of, of your demise, right? Of, of, of what it's like uh, to be on the other side of, of, you know, the hate and the oppression, right? Um, and, and I think, you know, less about here's the right answer, but more just about like my opinion is it, it is, it's such a hard thing to wrestle with, right. Um, where, you know, you, you're feeling pressure, um, and hate coming from multiple sides. Uh, I think this was really prevalent in Malcolm X's story as well, where, you know, he, he, he had, uh, the government and he was on their hit list. This is vague. I'm vaguely saying that. Um, but he, he was a threat, I think, to national security in in a way. And so like he, he's having to deal with this. But then internally, in terms of the nation of Islam, there's also a lot of discord and he's feeling threats from that. And, and it's just crazy how these leaders get in these pressure cookers um, where where it really feels like, uh, you know, <laughs> Where is my safe haven? Uh, wh where yeah. is the, the place that I feel I'm, I'm most embraced? And uh, I mean, I, I think that is just the reality of a revolutionary, right? Um, that feeling feeling pressure and feeling uh, like attacked, being attacked from all different sides. Mm. Yeah, sometimes the revolution must be individualized in more ways than one. Sometimes it has to be individualized in the sense of you've got to take personal responsibility for the changes that you want to see in the world and stop looking for other people to save you. But sometimes that individualization takes the form of you are the only one who cares about the cause you're fighting for and you must be willing to stand alone. And that can be heartbreaking. I think this is about something that's bigger than any tribe. One of the most heartbreaking revolution uh, revelations of a revolutionary is that sometimes the people that you serve 
won't serve you back. Sometimes the people that you fight for won't fight for you. Sometimes the people that you represent will not represent you. Sometimes you will talk good about people behind their back and they'll talk bad about you behind yours. Sometimes you'll go to bat and you'll give, give everything that you have for people. And the moment they have to help you out, they'll throw you right under the bus. And what that means is that you have to be willing to make up your mind about who you're going to fight for, not based on what you think you're going to get back from those people, but based on mm. what your convictions and core values are. If I'm going to fight for this tribe over here, it cannot be because of the expectation that that same tribe is going to lay down their life for me in the way that I might be willing to lay down my life for them. It's got to be because my value system says this is what I was born to do. And that tribe may never thank me for the sacrifices that I make for them, for the pain that I bear on their, their behalf. They may never even know about it. They may never give me my props, but I know that my work counted. I know that my work mattered because it's a work that gave my life meaning and expressed who I am. I think about something that my father said a while ago. He said, um, you reap what you sow, but not where you sow. That if you do good to someone, then good's going to come back to you. But that doesn't mean it's going to come back to you from the person that you helped out. You might help out another person and they may pretend like they don't even remember that that happened. And that's OK, because what goes around still comes around. Sometimes it just comes in a roundabout way. It doesn't come through that person that you did something for. It comes from God through a means that you can't even predict. And so that's the heartbreaking side. And that's the healing side. The heartbreaking side is the people that I help may never be there for me when I need them. The healing side is what's right is right anyway. And it's always rewarded by God, even if it's not recognized by man, you know? That, uh, that, that, that is a hard reality to grasp with. I, I, I think because so many times when, when we're fighting a fight, we want to feel like it, the fight that we're fighting is that, that somebody sees us fighting this fight, that somebody recognizes, yeah. that somebody appreciates uh, this fight that we're doing. Because when you're fighting a, a revolutionary battle, when you're fighting against something that is bigger and you're really trying to, to shift the paradigm, you're putting yourself through a version of hell. I mean, you are going to battle every single day uh, with, you know, what whatever the opposition looks like. Um, I think on a bigger scale, that could be, you know, oppressive forces. But on an individual scale, uh, you know, that that could be things that are are challenging you to your core values, like things in your life that are challenging you in terms of what you believe. You know, what do you stand for? Uh, you know. Do you listen to your intuition or you do you go with popular opinion? Like these are things that are challenging you to a, a very to your core, to your core beliefs. And these are not easy fights. These are very challenging fights. It's a reason that the vast majority of people go with what's easy, go with the common narrative, go with uh, popular opinion, because this fight is the fight that's swimming uphill. Or, or, or swimming upstream. You know, this is this is the fight that's going against the grain. This is not the easy choice. This is the more difficult choice, but the more fulfilling, the more freeing, you know, the more um, the, 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 the fight that, that that's going to give you more substance and, and, and just more life to you. Right. It, but it, again, it is not the easier fight. And so I think when when we're in these battles and we're trying to pull together the strength you just want to be seen you just want to be heard you just want to be appreciated um but i i think to the degree that you're fighting for truth as opposed to uh fighting for approval or acceptance or anything else i think that truth you know it sometimes is all the fulfillment that you're going to be able to get but if you really are fighting for truth if you really are fighting for for that, those inner convictions, then I think that that that's enough. But a lot of people don't know what that's like. And so they don't even know that they can be fulfilled by that feeling of truth. Uh, but it is it is such a powerful force, right? It's, it's such a force uh, that that can allow you to get up 
at 4 a.m. after you only had uh, four hours of sleep. I mean, it's a force that can push you to continue when you otherwise would quit. You hear this a lot in in parents, right? Like mothers uh, or 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 fathers who who would do anything, but they they get that conviction because it's something internal that they know that like I have a commitment to this child and I'm gonna do whatever. And people who don't have kids or or maybe even their younger selves could have never understood what that looks like, where that power comes from. How do I push myself past those points of resistance? So, you know, in your in your pursuit for truth, I, I think that's one of the most powerful aspects of fighting for truth is, is that it is a, a power source. It is uh, something yeah. that that can take you to the next level. But again, you know, w- when you're when you're fighting these fights, uh, I think the temptation and, and just the desire is. I want to be appreciated, I want to be accepted um, and, and, and sometimes that's not possible, at least at that moment. Um, yeah. You know, you, 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 you won't be recognized then and there. You know, and it, it's, it's healthy for the ego. It's very healthy to have people maybe criticize you or, or fail to give you credit in ways that might be shocking to you, like it was for Tupac. Sometimes it's helpful to have people be like, man, he didn't do anything for me. He didn't do anything for me. Or, or or to just treat you in a way that's so disrespectful or dangerous that it shows disregard for what you did for them. Sometimes that can be helpful because what it does is it forces you to be honest about your true motives. Sometimes when we set out to do something, we have these dreams. We have not only the fantasy of who we can be, but the fantasy of how we think other people will respond. So maybe if I dream of you know building a Fortune 500 company, I might have a corresponding fantasy of my mother being like, I'm so proud of you, son. Right. Or I may have a corresponding fantasy of like people back home at my dad's church being like, man, you the man. We so proud of you. And the question you got to ask yourself is, would you still pursue the dream if you knew that that fantasy would never come true? What if the things you need to do in order to put other people in a position to succeed are things that would cause them to misunderstand you as not actually loving them? Or what if there were things that would cause them to misunderstand you as a sellout or a selfish person? Would you still do it then? And if your answer is yes, you have yourself a true conviction. If your answer is no, well, it's good that you found out now what your real motives are, and maybe you should go do something <laughs> that's going to give you what you really want or what you're willing to own. To own. Mm. All right, man. I know we almost have time. Let's let's hit up number three. Let's do it. Happy are those who dream dreams and are ready to pay the price to make them come true. Wow. I feel like that's everything we always talk about, ain't it? <laughs> Because he didn't say happy are those who dream dreams and then stop there. There's no happiness in the mere dreaming of dreams. You know, there's a proverb that says hope deferred makes the heart sick. There are some people who are great at dreaming dreams and they feel more and more miserable because their life seems to be moving in the opposite direction of their dream because the circumstances and conditions that surround them seem to contradict their dream on all sides. But it's happy are those who dream and who are willing to pay the price. Because when you're willing to pay the price, even if you don't fulfill that dream, you get to experience the mark of distinction that is self-ownership. You get to know what it feels like to say, I gave it everything that I had and I didn't leave anything left to be desired. I gave my heart to the game. I gave my heart to the task. I have no doubts. I have no regrets. I know that it wasn't meant to be because I'm not sitting here wondering what would have happened had I worked a little harder, had I been a little bit more honest. And that's the glory of a life of self-ownership. There are trade-offs with everything that you do. There's no path you're ever going to take in life that involves avoiding the price. If you choose not to follow your dream, 
you are going to pay the price of having to torture yourself for the rest of your life with the question of what might have been. You're going to have to pay the price of telling people around you, yeah, I could have did that and having them laugh and be like, no, you couldn't have done that. And feeling like in your heart, you know, you could have. You'll have to pay the price of accepting some life that you never really wanted. There's always a price to pay. The possibility of failing when you go after what you want is only one form of failure. But refusing to go after it because of fear, that too is a form of failure. The failures that come from doing what is truly in your heart is the kind of failure that gives you glory. The failure that comes from refusing to confront what's within your soul, that's the kind of failure that brings shame in your life. So I, I love this quote, man, because it's about the most important economic truth, in my opinion, trade-offs, that there are trade-offs involved in everything. And self-ownership is about being able to recognize the trade-offs and being willing to own them and not expecting other people to save you from them or take responsibility for them. I think this quote says to me, is, is it really represents that Tupac was the voice of the dreamer. And, and I think mm. people might just view that as like, oh, well, obviously. But I think starting from the first quote that we talked about of, of living a nasty, unbearable uh, just like life of strife and hardship, that is so hard to maintain that that inner dreamer. That it is so hard not uh, to 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 just be overwhelmed with the burden of reality and allow yourself to to just succumb to the the struggle mentality or the victim mentality and. I wouldn't pa put that past anybody, right? I wouldn't put you know, given in to that past anybody, anybody that, that again, that is the choice that I think, I mean, millions of people have made throughout history. Um, yeah. and I don't even blame a lot of people. Like I have empathy for somebody who, who, who just kind of is like, well, the hell with it, you know, like this is just my life. I know people personally, friends of mine who we used to dream together and who were just like, nah, man, th th this is life. Uh, I'm just, this is adulthood, right? They, and they tell you a lot of times when you're coming up, like, enjoy being a kid because once you become adult, it's terrible, right? Uh, and, and I think being a dreamer is just beaten out of you um, and it's just conditioned out of you. And I think using, using this, this metaphor, this analogy of they using using they as as the force that that doesn't want to see you win. Losing your ability to dream allows them to put a cap on you, allows them uh, to, to limit, you know, what you can do and, and, and who you can become and, and the revolutions that you can create. And that's such a tragedy, right? Uh, you know, that that that's essentially given in to their goal. It, it's given in to the thing that that makes you another member of the herd, another gear in the cog versus the individual that actually has power. Mm. And I, I, I think, you know, happy are the, the dreamers who dream dreams. Yeah. Hell yeah. Of course, they're 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 happier. They're the people who are alive. They're the people who are living. They're the people uh, who who aren't who aren't wasting the life that they were given. Who aren't wasting the opportunity that they have. And yeah, yeah, th that can be hard to see. But like, I mean, the reason that we're here, the odds are we're naturally against us to begin with. I think the life of being born is like one in four hundred trillion. And I think those odds are insane. I mean, we're, yeah. statistically, there's all the reasons why you're not supposed to be here, uh, that you're not supposed to be born in this position, um, that you're not supposed to be, you know, born in this part of the country or whatever. There, I mean, there's odds for everything. And I and I think sometimes it's important to, to look at those things and have a certain level of appreciation and a certain level of, you know, just faith that like I overcome a lot of odds already or I overcame a lot of odds already. Like, what's to say that I can't continue to do that? Yeah. It's not a practice that we're taught. It's not it's not something that we're empowered to do to, to dream. 
Uh, It's something that we're actually taught to do the opposite, to, you know, accept this job, accept this life, uh, accept this reality next. And just, you know, go do this and then die kind of thing. Dream, you know, dare to dream. Yeah. I love that, bro. I love that. That's uh, we got it. We got a Sam back home where I grew up in the church. That'll preach. That'll preach, man. <laughs> That's just summer right there. <laughs> hey, we need sound effects, man. Straight up, we need we need uh, some <laughs> button where, 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 where the crowd just like erupt. Because <laughs> I, I don't I don't feel like I got the uh, Anthony O'Neill to to make it exciting. Like what you just said sounded exciting, but I don't have the hype man skill, so I need the the button I can push. <laughs> <laughs> You know, man, um, I'll I'll make one last point for me about uh, paying the price, because I think when when people talk about being willing to pay the price for dreams, that often takes the form of the price of other people criticizing you, doubting you, misunderstanding you for following your weird dream, or maybe the price of, you know, having to, to be poor for a while, having to look like you're losing or something like that. But I think there's another price that often has to be paid for dreams that's worth thinking about. If you've got something that you really want to make happen in your life, and that's the price of time. I think it's easy to underestimate just how much our fantasies and our visions of the good life correspond to assumptions we make about time. You know, maybe you got somewhere you want to be in life. Maybe there's a certain amount of money you want to make. Maybe there's a certain kind of house you want to have. And when you're fantasizing about that, how old are you in that fantasy? You know, how old are you in that fantasy? What does that fantasy mean to you if God were to say, okay, I'll make that happen for you when you're 60. I'll make that happen for you when you're 55. Does it mean the same thing to you? I think it's a fair question to ask yourself because sometimes the price we pay for a dream is the price of time, the price of having to wait a little bit longer than maybe we had hoped before we can realize those fantastic things because you never know how the cards play out in your life. And it's important to think about what are you not only willing to put up with mockery and doubt in order to create, but what are you willing to wait for if it doesn't come to you overnight in spite of all your efforts to work hard? That's my last thought, man. You got the final word on this, That's bro. That's real. Yeah. yeah again, I, I, I think, you know, what, what Tupac represents to me is it's the reality of what it's like to come from the bottom. It's the reality of what it's like to be in the pressure cooker. It's the reality of what it's like to have every force imaginable, you know, out for you. Um, But to still be able to enjoy life, to still be able to find fulfillment, to still be able to give back, to still be able uh, to empower others. And I I think at the fundamental level, it's a choice. It, It is a choice to live that kind of life. And you do have a choice. Every individual has choice. It's, it's the thing we have, um, especially us of those of us who live in, in, a, in, a, in a society that, for the most part, is free, that, that gives you the ability to choose. And it's just, you know, the, I think the reason that we highlight all of these figures is that a lot of times their circumstances were probably worse than yours as the audience. Or ours as the hosts, right? Like we're not necessarily dealing with um, people who are trying to bomb our house or who are trying to shoot up our car or, or whatever that looks like. But I think there are forms of, you know, oppression and there are forms of things that are trying to kind of take you down and things that are trying uh, to sabotage your success. And I, I, I think... You know, these leaders illustrate what's possible when you have a chip on your shoulder, what's possible when you have a rebellious and revolutionary mindset, when you're not willing to just accept what you're get what you're, you've been given, when you're willing to actually bet on yourself, bet on your potential, bet on your convictions and, and stand by them um, and, and not fold when resistance is is brought to you, right? But to actually double down and be like, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna take it to another level. 
Uh, I'm going to use this as an opportunity to push myself to newer heights. That's what the mindset's all about. Uh, you know, that, 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 that's what it's about. It's about your individual power, what you can do with it and what you choose to do with it. And that's it. That's it, man. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and supporting the revolution of one. Come out. What's next, man? I know we've done some talking about things that we want to mix up, kind of doing more of our conversations on social media and things that all things along those lines. Talk to the people about that for a minute. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as this project is growing, uh, you know, one of the things that's really important to us is is to grow the voices who who carry out this message right to empower more people because there's tons of people in this world living uh the a, a life of freedom right living a life of personal freedom that is in line with their own convictions and and priorities and preferences and all the other things that you know lead to living a freer and fuller life and so you know that that's the goal for the brand that's what we want to do we want to empower more people uh to to share messages of of that right and and you know we're, we're exploring all the different ways to do that i think on a lot of our social media channels we do that by quoting people and and showing clips of, of people speaking but i think we want to go to the next level and and bring people on uh to have their own shows and 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 to talk about you know these messages because you know things that tk says might only resonate with people that connect with TK's message. Things that I say might only resonate with people that connect with my message or the way that I, you know, say it or, or, or the kind of terms and, and the lingo that I use. And so to, to reach more people, we, we want other people to, to share this message and to share it in ways that are unique to them and ways that speak to their own life and, and their own uh, battles to find, you know, and to, to, for the purpose of connecting with other audiences that resonate with those individuals versus me or TK or whoever else. So that's, that's the direction, you know, it's, it's finding, uh, platforms and, uh, and, and just spokespeople, uh, to, to, to share larger, broader, more powerful, engaging, compelling messages of, of living life freely. And, and so, you know, we're, we're, We've ex we're exploring uh, options of doing live streaming on Instagram. We're exploring of of doing options on on Clubhouse and on on Twitter Spaces. So uh, you know, the, I think the details are still being worked out. But you know that that's the general direction that we're going to go and and we're going to continue to double down and and just you know blow this thing up. Yeah, but the conversations will still be happening. Whatever you love about what we're doing, we're still going to be bringing it to you. So there'll still be ways to tune in and support. So keep keep tracking us on Twitter. Keep tracking us on Instagram. Stay subscribed to the podcast and YouTube because we we're going to put some info out about about where we're doing things and who we're collaborating with. Uh, we're excited. We're just going to hit the pause button for a brief time, a brief time while we recalibrate so we can revolutionize. I just made that up. I was trying to I was trying to recalibrate to revolution. I don't even know if it worked. But hey, y'all, we out. Much love. <laughs>